Welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Robin Rombach. He is a researcher with Stability AI and one of the people behind Stable Diffusion, a tool that many of you have probably used already to generate impressive images from simple text prompts. Besides developing widely used tools, Robin is also an advocate for open source machine learning models. After completing his degree in physics at the University of Heidelberg in 2020, Robin dived into the AI domain and started his PhD in computer science, concentrating on generative deep learning models and specifically text to image systems. In his PhD research, he investigated cutting edge topics like VQGAN, taming transformers and latent diffusion models. For his talk today, he will walk us through the underlying paradigm of generative modeling and the training process of stable diffusion, giving us insights into the inner workings of an impressive tool. Without further ado, I'm very happy that he is here with us today. Welcome, Robin Rombach. Yeah, hi, I'm Robin. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, thanks for the invitation to this event. Uh, it's actually very cool to see this kind of interest, this kind of engagement um, <laughs> in, in German companies uh, for, this, for this topic. So, um, yeah, I have the easy task of presenting pretty pictures today with a slight technical touch. Uh, I hope the talk stri strikes a balance. Um, yeah, let's see. So, my talk is about latent generative models and some of the applications. And it's mostly centered around image synthesis and image editing. Um, and yeah, and as Thomas has already pointed out, this has been kind of the core of my research at the PhD at uh, first Heidelberg University and then later LMU Munich. Okay, uh, let's have a look at some results from recent generative uh, models for image synthesis. So I'm pretty sure that uh, some of you have seen these images of Pope Francis wearing a puffy white coat. Uh, these were, they, they went quite viral a few months ago. So these were generated with Midjourney. Midjourney is a commercial text to image generative model. Here's some more um, examples from Stable Diffusion XL. This is a latent diffusion model that we at Stability published last week. And the reason why I show these images is that we can now see that it's possible to generate these highly complex, high quality images with a single model. And the boundary between real and artificially generated content is really vanishing. And in addition, uh, we are also seeing the first entirely AI generated video clips. So on the left, we have uh, clips from Runway's Gen 2 model, and on the right, NVIDIA's video LDM. And the question is a bit, how did we end up here? Um, and I will try to answer this at least partially in the talk today. And I want to start with a very brief overview of the really short history of text-to-image models. And then um, I'll give a motivation for why I think that latent generative models um, are useful based on something that's called the generative learning trilemma. Um, yeah, and after that, I will introduce some of the approaches that I've been working on. Um, in particular, that will be taming transformers and latent diffusion models for high resolution image synthesis. And the latent diffusion approach is also the basis for the model stable diffusion. And then I will finish the talk with an overview of the next steps that I find interesting in this field and also describe some of the challenges that come with these kind of models. All right, so the progress that this field has made is in like seven to eight years, it's extremely impressive. So on the top left, we have a few samples from a very early um, text to image model based on a recurrent neural network. Uh, on the top right, we have a GAN. Uh, these are trying to synthesize the caption or the prompt. A stop sign is flying in the blue skies and we see it's like barely recognizable. You get the idea, but low resolution, low quality. Um, and then on the bottom, we have outputs from Dolly 2, from Stable Diffusion, from Midjourney. Uh, all of these models were introduced last year. And they now reach this megapixel quality and very good generalization. You can synthesize basically anything you want. And now that we have these arbitrary content megapixel images, um, even the metrics that we as researchers were used to in evaluating these kind of models, they start to become obsolete. Um, and they cannot really capture the level of detail anymore um, at, which, at which like these current state-of-the-art models operate. So for example, um, 
one of my current co-workers, he has a background in the creative industry, and he's always criticizing the models in terms of lighting, in terms of how the objects in the synthesized images are posed, and so on. And I think this is an indication that we kind of crossed a threshold at which these models actually become useful. Before that, they were kind of interesting as a research artifact. Now you can really use them for image editing and for video editing. Um, and yet, this is actually really exciting to see, like, um, because my PhD also started with these blurry samples, and now we have these, um, these, these high-quality samples, and it's also really interesting to see where this uh, space evolves to in the next couple of years. Okay, so one uh, remarkable feature about stable diffusion is its efficiency. Um, so it achieves a similar image quality as other large-scale text image models. So for example, Party and Imagine that were published by Google um, and Make a Scene, this is a Facebook or meta model. Um, the quality metric here um, on the y-axis is so-called FID score, which is kind of a standard metric to evaluate the quality of these image synthesis models. Um, and the lower score is better here. So we can see in this plot that stable diffusion really strikes a balance between uh, quality and sampling speed. And in addition to that, it can also be run on consumer-type hardware, some very old uh, GPUs that were used for gaming. Um, the question is a bit, what makes it good and efficient at the same time? And I think there's probably a variety of reasons, but one of them is that uh, stable diffusion is one of those latent generative models. And in particular, it's a latent diffusion model. And I will introduce that in a bit. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to provide a motivation why I think that these latent generative models uh, is really what we need if you want to do efficient, high-resolution image synthesis with neural networks. But as we will see later, there might also be like a broader explanation for why these latent generative models are actually useful. Okay, so let's set ourselves a goal. Um, and the goal is we want to train a single, very general uh, model that is able to generate basically any image you ask it for. So for example, um, like images here on the slide, um, these are kind of diverse images from a diverse uh, data set that's called open images. And these images here include um, depictions of humans, depictions of animals, depictions of um, non-living objects. They have cartoons, artworks, etc. So any image you can think of, basically. And usually, when, when we want to train such a model, um, we are facing a situation that has been described as something that's called the generative learning trilemma. Um, so ideally, we want a model that is uh, fast to sample from, that achieves a good coverage of the distribution, so of this very broad general data set that we train it on, and uh, that can synthesize complex compositions. And also very important, or maybe the most important thing, is that the model must achieve a high image quality in the outputs. Um, so we can consider a few candidates for such a model. Um, the first class is so-called single-step explicit likelihood-based models. Um, and for these models, we have um, two kind of popular candidates. One is variational order encoder. Uh, the other are normalizing flows. Um, so these models are really fast to sample from. And in theory, they should achieve a good mode coverage, a good diversity. Um, in practice, they have only been, uh, been scaled to like these human face portrait images, and the quality of those is even not really good. They're kind of blurry. Um, then we have another class of models, which are called implicit likelihood models, or um, GANs. And there's like one very f um, famous uh, instance of a GAN, which is called StyleGAN. Um, and these models are super fast, and they achieve high quality, but they are restricted to these uh, yeah, simple domains, again, like um, face portraits or these an um, animal portraits. And in addition to that, GANs are really complicated to train. You, it requires really deep knowledge of the whole process. Um, yeah, so that makes them not as attractive. Um, and then we have the third class. This is kind of where all of the state-of-the-art models currently um, are built from. So this is, uh, these, these are called iterative explicit likelihood-based models. And it, like two instances of those are diffusion models and autoregressive models. Um, autoregressive models are kind of the state of the art in natural language processing right now. Large language models are mostly um, autoregressive models, like ChatGPT. 
and uh, diffusion models and also to some extent autoregressive models are defining the state of the art in image synthesis. So these uh, models achieve these very good uh, quality samples and most importantly they can cover these complex distributions and achieve uh, highly complex compositions and we can scale them to like internet scale data sets. All right, so um, very, very brief motivation for what a diffusion model is. Um, the basic idea here is that such a um, denoising diffusion model should invert a Markov chain that gradually adds noise to the data until the signal is completely destroyed. This means that we have a model that consists of two parts. Uh, one is the encoder. This is often called the diffusion, diffusion process and a decoder, um, which is called the denoising process. Interesting part about this encoder or the diffusion process is that it is fixed and it adds stepwise the small amounts of Gaussian noise to the data until we finally approach a standard normal distribution. And then the learning task for the decoder is to basically invert that stepwise process. Yeah, but these um, iterative likelihood-based models, and in particular also diffusion models, uh, come with a few disadvantages. So one is from their generative learning dilemma that they are slow to sample from because we have to do we have to invert this iterative process, um, which means we have to apply the same model again and again and again to arrive at a denoised sample. Um, it's really expensive to train these models um, directly in pixel space, so we need a lot of compute to train them. And another reason is that uh, both autoregressive models and diffusion models optimize explicit likelihood as their training objective. Um, and this is not necessarily equivalent to perceptual quality. Uh, so in fact, these explicit likelihood-based models, they need to learn both if they are trained from scratch. They need to learn both uh, classical image compression, like JPEG algorithm, and image generation at the same time. And this kind of means that we are uh, wasting model capacity for modeling details in the images that we as human observers or consumers of the generated images do not even uh, perceive in the end. And this is a key difference to, for example, uh, large language models, uh, language modeling. Language is this natural, highly efficient representation of the world with uh, high information density. Uh, and in contrast, images and also videos um, these are multi-dimensional natural signals, uh, which contain a lot of these redundancies and imperceptible details that I talked about. And this is now where our work on latent generative models uh, becomes kind of important. And with this, I'll, I'll just drop our proposed solution, um, but then go through it step by step. Uh, so the main idea is to move this generative modeling process into a computationally more suitable space. Uh, and for that, we use the latent space of a pre-trained autoencoder that we actually optimize for perceptual quality. And this means that um, our autoencoder, which is itself a neural network, uh, takes an input image and maps it to a lower dimensional representation of that image. And from that representation, the task of the autoencoder is to reconstruct the image at a high fidelity at a high um, perceptual equivalence to the input image. Um, yeah, and for that late re latent representation, we can either use a discrete or a continuous representation. Um, I will go into more details for the continuous one in, in a second when, we, when I talk about diffusion models, but for now let's first focus on a discrete case. Because this discrete representation was kind of where we as a research group started um, for, for this approach. Um, in the paper Retaining Transformers for High Resolution Image Synthesis. And this is almost three years old, actually. Okay, so um, that approach is actually, it's fairly straightforward. So, as I said, the main goal was to avoid modeling these uh, fine high frequency details. And therefore, we introduced this model uh, that's called VQGAN. Uh, and VQGAN um, represents an image as a sequence of entries from a learned codebook as a discrete representation. And for that, we used, um, we, we built on existing work, we used something that was, that was an architecture that was called VQBAE, 
And VQBAE um, relies on straight through gradient estimation and vector quantization to learn this codebook and the encoder and decoder modules. And the encoder and decoder models are themselves, as I said, convolutional neural networks. And after training this model, we have like a discrete compact representation of an image. So the disadvantage of uh, only VQBAE uh, was that if, if you would train it in that formulation, uh, you would get like blurry reconstructions when we reduce the capacity of this codebook of the latent representation too much. And we don't want blurry reconstructions because in the end, um, this kind of limits the quality of the generative model that we train on top of the latent representation later. So the goal is to achieve the highest possible um, fidelity in the reconstructions, but also reduce the capacity of the codebook because um, if we reduce the capacity of the codebook of the latent representation, uh, we have a better way to capture the global composition of the image. And uh, we can also reduce the cost of training uh, the generative model in the end and also of sampling from it. So um, yeah, we had to come up with an objective that uh, would still allow these high compression rates, but avoid this blurriness effect. And for that, uh, we did two things. So on the one hand, to ensure that the codebook captures only the perceptually relevant features, uh, we used a, a loss that is called perceptual loss that was already established in computer vision. And this perceptual loss uh, was demonstrated that it aligns well with human perception. But only using that would still introduce artifacts because, um, yeah, as I said, we were inter interested in high compression rates. So um, to really encourage that the model commits to one of the possible reconstructions and actually favors realism over minimal reconstruction error, we augmented the training with an adversarial objective. So for that, we added a patchwise discriminator that acted locally on the reconstructions um, and applied it in this patchwise fashion so that only the local realism of the reconstructions was affected. Um, so only the texture kind of of the reconstructions was driven by the discriminator and the global coherence was still driven by the perceptual reconstruction metric. Um, uh, very quickly, the total loss of the model is actually just then a combination of this VQ loss, reconstruction loss, and the adversarial loss. Uh, we introduced this kind of fancy adaptive loss weighting. Um, but yeah, I think we can probably skip that for now and look at some results. Um, so. Um, yeah, on the left, we have an input, um, this image of the scribble, and let's focus on the, on the paw of the scribble. So for, for a standard discrete VAE, like a VQ VAE, um, and this is also actually the odd encoder that was used for OpenAI's Dolly 1 model, we see that the overall structure of the reconstruction is quite good, um, but the local details and the texture in the reconstruction is really blurry. Um, the stone is not crisp, the paw is not, not crisp, the fur of the, of the scroll is also not crisp. Um, and then if we use the exa exact same latent capacity for uh, the representation and train this VQGAN formalism, uh, so this is the second column from the right, um, we see that we have a high uh, quality reconstruction. It looks like a natural image um, at a high fidelity, has realistic looking texture and aligns well with the input. And uh, we can now even reduce the compression rate even further. So that factor F here means how much we downsample uh, an input image spatially. So if we have like a 256 by 256 uh, pixel image that would be downsampled with a factor of eight to 32 by 32 or with a factor of 16 to 16 by 16. And um, yeah, we can increase this even further. This is um, the rightmost column here and we see that the Paw still looks realistic, but its pose and its shape are not perfectly aligned with the input anymore. So um, this is what I meant previously when I said uh, that we want the model to commit to realism over a minimal reconstruction error. All right, so um, what we've seen is this approach gives us the ability to compress an image to a um, latent representation and uh, to reconstruct from that at a high fidelity but we still don't have like a full generative model from this um, because the only thing that we can do so far is taking an input image, compressing it to a latent representation and then reconstructing from it. So what we now do in the next step is we take that pre-trained VQGAN model, fix it, um, and we then train a transformer model in that latent space. Because it's a discrete representation, we can actually just take all the knowledge from um, 
large language model training from NLP, because that's how um, language models are trained. So we take this discrete representation, flatten it in a, into a 1D sequence, and do autoregressive uh, next token prediction on that representation. And then we can just apply standard transformer, um, transformer training for this. And we can additionally pass like conditioning information, such as yeah, a class label or more interesting, probably text tokens by concatenating them to the sequence. And then we have like powerful multimodal models like a text to image model. Um, in our university lab, we couldn't do the full text to image modeling because uh, that is really, really expensive. And uh, so we had to restrict ourselves to kind of a simple, simpler distribution. So we scraped a few um, landscape images and trained the model on those. But yeah, we can see that we can still achieve like uh, high quality results with, with this approach. Um, and then uh, because we couldn't afford this training, I'm actually happy that Google came along and took this approach and scaled it for a general text to image model. So they published a paper last year that is called Party. Um, it's exactly the, the approach that I described. And it translates uh, text um, into an image representation, into a discrete image representation from which uh, the image can be decoded. And they really demonstrated that this approach is scalable to really large model sizes, up to 20 billion parameters, um, and can be trained on large-scale data sets. All right. Um, but actually, in a lot of discussions um, on this topic, I'm asked, isn't it a bit unnatural to uh, to force images into this discrete representation and model them like, like language. And I think I agree. It is a bit unnatural. And this is one of the reasons why we then also shifted our focus and started to apply um, the latent generative approach for diffusion models instead of these autoregressive discrete uh, transformers. So this is kind of the continuous alternative to this autoregressive transformer approach that I just presented. Um, the difference is that we now um, move to a continuous latent space instead of a discrete one. Um, and one of the um, advantages, if we do that, is that we do not need to compress as much as with the discrete approach, um, which means that the loss in perceptual quality of these reconstructions becomes really, really small. So we can find a better trade-off between compression and quality. Um, and on a technical level, instead of using this vector quantization um, in the latent space, we just regularize it slightly to look a bit like a Gaussian distribution. And then this makes the representation continuous. Um, yeah, and when we, when we started that approach, we were also interested in, in text to image modeling um, right from the start. But when, when we started, there was no architecture available for text to image diffusion. So uh, we had to come up with an approach. And what we did is we took this unit, which was used in the simple diffusion models that existed, and added small transformer blocks um, inside, the, inside the unit. And these uh, transformer blocks are actually, as you probably know, um, self-attention layers, cross-attention layers, and feed-forward layers. Um, and yeah, we, ha we now have this kind of NLP-like encoder-decoder architecture. Um, so we can learn this encoder jointly with the diffusion model. The encoder is shared for all diffusion steps and all feature resolutions. Um, it could be like a standard natural language transformer encoder without masking, first pre-processing a text sequence and then mapping that into the unit through the cross-attention layers. Um, yeah, and you could either train this encoder jointly with the diffusion model or take a pre-trained language model approach. Um, both of those work quite well. All right, so uh, we took that approach. Um, and luckily, we were able to do a collaboration with uh, Stability AI, uh, trained it on 256 A100 GPUs for 600 hours, arrived at this checkpoint, um, 850 millimeter, uh, million parameters, uh, 2.1 gigabyte. Um, that was, uh, yeah, that, that is the stable diffusion model. So these are text to image samples from, I think, stable, diff stable diffusion 1.4. Um, I did not create them, I just collected them on Discord because I'm not as talented as other people in this. Um, yeah, but the model can actually be used for more than just text to image generation. It could also be used for image to image editing. Uh, because we can take this trained diffusion model now um, and apply a bit of noise to, a, to an input image such that we don't destroy the full signal. So for example, here we can take like the sketch of the tower, apply a bit of noise, and then use the pre-trained model and change the, the, the text prompt to, let's say, photographic style 
and decode, decode back, remove the noise with the model. And then we see that we have this uh, sketch to image translation model that we can control through natural language, which is really powerful. Uh, so I did the same for, for one of the sketches um, that I did, um, this, this landscape image. And then you can really see that you can control the style just by varying the text prompt, which is really, really cool. So um, yeah, we can transform this into a watercolor painting, into a digital artwork, trending on ArtStation. Uh, we can even yeah, uh, set the style of a certain artist. I removed the name here because this is kind of a delicate topic, but it's possible. Uh, people use this to upgrade their child's artwork um, or transform it, I don't know. Um, yeah. And so we see in this example that the structure has changed quite a bit of these input images, um, but you can actually take the pre-trained model um, and fine-tune it into a structure preserving model by adding an additional um, channel that processes, for example, a depth map. And then we really have the structure preserving model that we can still control through natural language. Um, yeah, and this model can then be used to recreate a given image based on text prompts and very closely retains the original shape. Um, so this is, can be used for transforming, for example, stability CEO into a robot or some cookie monster. Um, we can also do this um, for in painting. So instead of adding a, a depth map, we can add a, a mask. And then we can fine tune this model into an in painting model, which can be used uh, to remove objects in existing uh, in input images. Um, or because it's still uh, controllable through natural language, it's, it's like a really easy image editing tool now. So we can change the background here of this, uh, of this leopard um, or make it wear virtual reality goggles, change what kind of object sits on this bench here. Um, another application is super resolution. So um, yeah, just instead of providing a mask or a depth map, we can provide a low resolution image and then upscale this image, which is also generative process because detail needs to be added, generated. Um, and again, this can be controlled through natural language. So while upscaling, we can change the style to a professional photograph, but also to a digital artwork. And yeah, now, um, with, especially with the open source release of that model, um, these latent generative models basically are everywhere. So people apply this to lots of things, um, like to med medical applications, to 3D graphics. There are tons of plugins in GIMP, in Photoshop. Um, it was used for video editing. Uh, the model, like this, this latent diffusion modeling approach, it has been apply to a lot of different domains now. Uh, so it can be used for 3D shape generation, for example. And there you, the, the basic approach is you, you design a different audio encoding approach. As this one is tailored towards 3D representations. And then you can train this uh, general diffusion model in the latent space of that audio encoder. The same works for biology. So this is a model that is uh, generating cryo OEM structures. And there's a lot more. Uh, I don't want to go through all of them, but, but this just serves. Um, it, it should just highlight the fact that this approach is very general. Um, it can be used for 3D. It can be used for language generation, for segmentation, uh, video generation, audio generation, and so on. And I think this shows like this, that this latent generative modeling approach is, yeah, it, it is a very general approach that you can apply to a lot of problems. And you can combine domain knowledge in that first stage. So what, what we did was also kind of introducing that domain knowledge about images, about the perceptual compressibility of the images, and then train in a second stage that general generative model on it. Um, yeah, so this works for images, but also for video, for 3D. And I really think actually that in the future for video and 3D, this will be even more important. All right, so um, let's yeah, let's, let's talk about a few next steps and also um, the challenges that come with these models. Uh, first of all, uh, shameless plug for our new model that we released uh, through Stability last week, uh, Stable Diffusion XL. It's a significant improvement over the previous versions that were, uh, were available. Right now it's available for research, um, but we will release it open source within the next two weeks probably. So it's a much larger model. Um, and um, in certain evaluations, it actually is on par with the current mid-journey model, so that's very cool. Um, 
Okay, one of the one of the next steps now, even with these larger models, because they become more heavy, is if you think about this generative learning dilemma that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, these iterative models they are they are kind of slow to sample from. So this is an obvious um, way where we want to improve the, improve them. Um, and I just want to highlight one of the works here that I participated on, but there are lots of more a uh, lot more works on this topic. Uh, it's actually distillation of these diffusion models. So you're trying to accelerate the sampling process um, and bring it from like 20 to 50 function evaluations down to something like 4 to 8. Um, and then there's also another approach that I briefly want to introduce. Um, so instead of just scaling the model, so this obviously works, um, but instead of just doing that, we can also think about other approaches. Because uh, one of the interesting aspects of stable diffusion was its usability and its easy uh, fine tunability, trainability, low compute cost. So is there a way to improve, to improve the performance without scaling the model even further? Um, and one approach is um, retrieval. So if we, if we think about what a generative model actually learns during training, then we have this training data set, generative model, and the first task is to learn like certain visual concepts, right? So it has to learn how a hedgehog looks like, how a truck looks like, how a street looks like, and then generate those. Um, but it also has to learn the composition of these different things. So we want to be able to generate, uh, for example, this picture of a hedgehog crossing a road in front of a truck. Um, so one approach that we could try is simplifying this learning task by actually providing these visual concepts explicitly to the model. And for that, we can introduce something like an external database where these visual concepts are um, stored in, um, define a retrieval function, how we retrieve from that database, uh, and condition the generative model, the diffusion model, on, the, on those retrieved instances. And then uh, the intuition is that there is no need to spend capacity on task one, and we can focus the model on the compositionality task. Um, so the only task left is um, retrieving the objects and composing them into this new um, image. And yeah, we, we had a work on this uh, retrieval augmented diffusion models. And the basic idea was to do a k nearest neighbor search in that external database, then use clip as an encoder, um, condition the diffusion model on the clip image embeddings, um, and yeah, um, simplify the task that way. And what we can see is that by using clip, uh, we actually have also this nice zero-shot text-to-image synthesis uh, capability. So uh, because clip has this shared text image feature embedding space, we can simply replace uh, the image embeddings at inference time with a text embedding. Um, and then we can, yeah, we have a model that is able to synthesize images based on text prompts, although it has never seen text prompts uh, during training. So this was trained on ImageNet, which is a standard benchmark, but it doesn't come with, um, it's, it's one million images, it's a rather small uh, data set for today's standards. Uh, it doesn't come with text annotations, but we can still um, do creative text to image synthesis on it with this approach. So we can synthesize zebra skin pandas, teddy riding motorcycles. These images are definitely not in the ImageNet database, so this is quite cool. Um, yeah, then, Another few promising directions for the future. Obviously, 3D generation, there's a lot of exciting work on uh, trying to learn 3D representations based on 2D diffusion models. One of them is called Dream Fusion uh, that was published last year, uh, I think in October. Um, it's really cool because you can really see how in these large-scale pre-trained models like Stable Diffusion, there is knowledge, implicit knowledge about the 3D world, and you can try to extract that from them. Um, then video modeling obviously has to improve, so we can do like these small clips nowadays, but uh, pushing this to longer videos is, um, I guess, interesting. Also, training a very large-scale model for video, like a GPT for video, um, might be interesting from the, just from the representations that such a model learns. Is it able to develop a physical understanding of the world? Can you extract geometry from that? Um, and can you combine it maybe with a 3D model? Then another interesting approach in that direction is also can we, like if, if we do the, uh, the, the latent generative approach, uh, can we learn other representations than just grids? Uh, so for, for our works, we usually just did this compression to, to grids. Um, but 
could we do something like spatially adaptive representations? Could we um, learn abstract concepts like just a set of vector embeddings? Or for, mo for video, um, could we disentangle motion vectors from the actual content in that video? So I think there's a lot of stuff to explore. Um, and also these models, they, they, they come with certain challenges. So if we remember that image of Pope Francis um, and the photorealism, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen like these images of Trump being arrested by the police. These were generated by Midjourney, uh, also quite viral on Twitter. Uh, lots of um, debate around how this will change um, the general perception of, of media. And I think it is an important uh, debate, an important question to ask. Uh, there are research approaches to this, to actually embed watermarks in these kind of models, such that it is actually not visible in the, in the image for a human observer that the um, image was generated by an AI or not, but you can detect it with that approach. So you can run, you can run this algorithm, um, embed kind of a key in the, in the um, noise that is used to generate the image, um, and then from the generated image, try to extract that key and then tell whether the image is artificially generated or not. There are a lot of approaches in this direction, and I think it's a super important research topic. Okay, uh, that was it, basically. Um, thanks to all my collaborators, um, in particular Patrick, Andreas, and maybe the key takeaways. So these latent generative models, they are efficient, and they are scalable. You can combine domain knowledge with a very general purpose approach, like this explicit iterative of likelihood-based models. But on the other hand, all of these parts are still moving, um, especially in this, in this first stage. So I'm, I'm actually not even sure if we in the future will stick with latent approaches for image synthesis. I'm pretty sure that we will need it for video synthesis. But yeah, as compute scales, um, the more power becomes available for images that might become an unnecessary step. Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>